On July 8, 2022, former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was assassinated in broad daylight while giving a campaign speech, sending shockwaves throughout the world. As the longest-serving Prime Minister in history, he was the face of Japan on the global stage during his tenure from 2012 to 2020. With his sudden death, foreign news outlets revisited the ideology and politics of the deceased Prime Minister with no issue more prevalent in obituaries than Abe's final unattained goal, the revision of Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution, the Peace Article. In this video I want to take an in-depth look at the debate surrounding constitutional revision and try to answer the question if Article 9 should be amended or left alone. The question of revising Article 9 of the Japanese Constitution is arguably one of the most controversial issues in contemporary Japanese political discourse and the debate surrounding it has been raging ever since its inception in 1946. World War II was finally over and the US occupied the Japanese archipelago. The occupation had two main goals. First, make sure Japan never remilitarizes and attacks the US again. Second, install a democratic or rather capitalist regime. For the fulfillment of both goals, a new constitution was needed. Governor-General Douglas MacArthur gave guidelines to his legal team for a new Japanese constitution. The guideline regarding war said, quote, War as a sovereign right of the nation is abolished. Japan renounces it as an instrumentality for settling its disputes and even for preserving its own security. It relies upon the higher ideals which are now stirring the world for its defense and its protection. No Japanese army, navy or air force will ever be authorized and no rights of belligerency will ever be conferred upon any Japanese force." Unquote. The MacArthur legal team toned it down, however, by omitting, quote, and even for preserving its own security, unquote, as this was considered too extreme for the time. The legal team argued that every nation possesses the inalienable right of self-defense. This omission left the vague possibility for self-defense forces to be established in the future. Article 9 subsequently says, quote, Aspiring sincerely to an international peace based on justice and order, the Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation and the threat or use of force as means of settling international disputes. In order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. The right of belligerency of the state will not be recognized." Unquote. You may ask yourself, why would the self-defense right not be included? Isn't it common sense that countries, just like people, should have the right to defend themselves? At the time, there were people who believed differently for compelling reasons. Prime Minister Shigeru Yoshida, for example, said, quote, I think that the very recognition of such a thing, i.e. for a state to wage war in legitimate self-defense, is harmful. It is a notable fact that most modern wars have been waged in the name of the self-defense of states. It seems to me, therefore, that the recognition of the right of self-defense provides the cause for starting a war, unquote. In fact, many offensive wars in the 20th century were proclaimed as self-defense. The Marco Polo Bridge incident as the starting point of the Second Sino-Japanese War in 1937 was widely circulated as an act of self-defense by Japanese propagandists. In the end, however, the right to self-defense is somewhat implied in Article 9 and would be referred to sooner rather than later. The policy of the US occupation of Japan initially lied in anti-fascism. In the late 1940s, the relationship between the Soviet Union and the United States began to deteriorate and communism was identified as the new enemy of Western democracies. The Cold War began and would extend itself from Berlin to Japan as the policy of the occupation changed to anti-communism. Instead of keeping the Japanese state demilitarized, the goal has shifted to turning Japan into an effective ally against the global wave of communist revolutions that began to pop up in Indochina, East Asia and Europe. Calls from Washington for a moderate rearmament of Japan were initially simply refused by MacArthur, who believed in his constitution. With the start of the Korean War in 1950 and the subsequent deployment of US troops from Japan to Korea, MacArthur had no choice but to create an ad hoc army. In order to not create conflict with the Yong Constitution, he called it the National Police Reserve, or Keisatsu Yobitai in Japanese. 
This police reserve was armed with rifles, mortars, artillery and even some tanks. The Japanese and US authorities employed non-military vocabulary whenever they could in order to keep up the force of the police force that was very obviously an army. During the 1950s, the US pressured Japan to rearm, but Prime Minister Yoshida opposed it. Why? Yoshida realized he could save the portion of national budget that is usually reserved for the military to revive the economy, and because the US would never let Japan fall against external or internal communist threats, there was no downside to refuse rearmament. When Yoshida was criticized for his refusal, he could simply refer to Article 9 and say that he has no choice in the matter. This state of affairs could not go on forever, as the US government under Eisenhower tried to cut down the military budget. Japan had no choice but to provide at least a basic means of self-defense. The San Francisco Peace Treaty was signed in 1951, officially ending the US occupation of Japan. US-Japan security relations would now be regulated by the US-Japan Security Treaty. One portion of the treaty said, quote, The United States of America, in the interest of peace and security, is presently willing to maintain a certain of its armed forces in and about Japan, in the expectation, however, that Japan will itself increasingly assume responsibility for its own defense against direct and indirect aggression, always avoiding any armament which could be an offensive threat or serve other than to promote peace and security in accordance with the purposes and principles of the United Nations Charter." Unquote. It was very clear at this point that the United States wanted Japan to establish self-defense forces. In 1954, Yoshida succumbed to the pressure and made a complete 180 in recognizing the right of Japan for self-defense. The Diet passed the Self-Defense Forces Act, which made the National Police Reserve into the Self-Defense Forces. As the SDF are only permitted to engage in the defense of the Japanese archipelago, limitations on equipment, size and rules of engagement were set. Weapons that are determined to be used mainly offensively, like ICBMs, aircraft carriers and strategic bombers cannot be procured. Also, at the time collective self-defense, that is, assisting allies like the US in case they are attacked, was outlawed as are preemptive strikes. After Shigeru Yoshida's term as Prime Minister ended, Article 9 was constantly under fire from conservative nationalists like Nobusuke Kishi, who wanted to revise it in order for Japan to be able to adequately participate in the fight against communism. After the end of the Cold War and the emergence of the War on Terror, legislation passed in the 1990s and 2000s, which gave the SDF the ability to send humanitarian and logistical troops overseas on UN missions. Logistical and reconstruction support forces were depatched in the Iraq War in 2003. Until this time, constitutional revision was often talked about by conservatives, but ultimately no serious effort was ever conducted. This, however, would soon change. When Shinzo Abe became Prime Minister for the first time in 2006, he was eager to embody a strong leader, hawkish on foreign policy, and turn Japan, quote, into a normal country, unquote. This famous line from his book refers to Article 9, which restricts Japan more in its defensive capabilities than normal countries. Abe started his revisionist ambitions by employing a committee to examine whether Japan could engage in collective self-defense. Scenarios imagined included repelling attacks against a US vessel in open seas, intercepting ballistic missiles fired towards the US, and using weapons to safeguard other nations' units during UN peacekeeping missions. The committee concluded that a constitutional reinterpretation would suffice to establish collective self-defense. A revision of Article 9 was not deemed necessary. As Abe was ousted from office just one year later in 2007, he could not act on the committee's decision. In 2012, after a disastrous three-year tenure by the Democratic Party, Abe returned to the Prime Minister's office on a wave of support for his Liberal Democratic Party. This time, however, Abe tried a different route. Instead of trying to revise Article 9 directly, he wanted to revise Article 96 of the Constitution, which states that any amendment needs a supermajority in both houses as well as a public referendum. Abe tried to lower the supermajority to a simple majority. This effort, however, did not gain much support either and Abe returned to the committee and asked it to update its report. In 2014 they reached the same conclusion 
as they did previously in 2007. Abe then consolidated his political support in order to legislate the reinterpretation. He needed to make concessions to his more liberal partners in the Diet, but in 2014 he announced his cabinet's new interpretation of Article 9. Japan could now exercise collective self-defense and can dispatch military aid to an ally under attack. The cabinet decision reads in part, quote, the government has reached a conclusion that not only when an armed attack against Japan occurs, but also when an armed attack against a foreign country that is in close relationship with Japan occurs and as a result threatens Japan's survival and poses a clear danger to fundamentally overturn people's right to life, liberty and pursuit of happiness. And when there is no other appropriate means available to repel the attack and ensure Japan's survival and protect its people, use of force to the minimum extent necessary should be interpreted to be permitted under the constitution as measures for self-defense in accordance with the basic logic of the government's view to date." Unquote. The passage, and as a result threatens Japan's survival and poses a clear danger, was only added at the request of Abe's more Davish coalition partner, New Komeito. For Abe this was an important step in the right direction, but far from enough to cement his personal ambitions of remilitarization on solid constitutional ground. The reinterpretation of Article 9 has been passed into law, but it is certainly not safe from being declared unconstitutional. You may ask yourself at this point, where is the Japanese Supreme Court in all this? A reinterpretation like this is obviously in conflict with the constitution and should at least be heard by the highest judiciary in the country. So where does the Supreme Court stand on it? The Japanese Supreme Court has until now only ruled once in regard to Article 9. In the famous Sunakawa case of 1959, the court found that, quote, certainly there's nothing in Article 9 which would deny the right of self-defense inherent in our nation as a sovereign power. The pacifism advocated in our constitution was never intended to mean defenselessness or non-resistance, unquote. With this ruling, the court has confirmed that Japan possesses an inherent right to self-defense, which does not fall under the restrictions placed upon by Article 9. The Supreme Court also ruled that, quote, in the absence of an unmistakable or clear violation, the courts were to defer to the judgment of the political branches on the issue of constitutionality, unquote, which essentially means that the Supreme Court permits the government to define the constitutionality of policies regarding Article 9 until clear violation. The court, however, has not specified what constitutes a clear violation, so it leaves open the possibility to interject at any time. Abe's reinterpretation, however, basically extended the Supreme Court's Sunakawa interpretation from self-defense to collective self-defense. It is hard to predict, however, if this goes beyond the clear violation line that was established and if the court is going to address the 2015 legislation anytime soon. Why? The Supreme Court of Japan has been described as the most conservative constitutional court in the world, and for good reason. One might characterize it as conservative in the sense of being so passive or cautious that it almost never challenges the government. Alternatively, or in addition, one might characterize it as conservative in the sense that it happens to share the ideological views and preferences of Japan's long-ruling conservative party, the Liberal Democratic Party. What is clear, however, is that the label fits. Since its creation in 1947, the court has struck down only eight statutes on constitutional grounds. One thing is for sure, the reinterpretation has been criticized widely by constitutional scholars. When the bill was submitted to the parliament for debate, renowned scholars were invited to provide expert testimony. All three agreed that the bill was unconstitutional. Even the scholar who was invited by Abe's LDP stated that the bill violated the constitution. In the wake of the debate, almost 200 constitutional law professors issued a joint statement condemning the bill as unconstitutional. The Japanese Bar Association also condemned the bill. As the LDP held the majority in both houses, the bill nevertheless passed and became law in 2015. The opposition by constitutional scholars, of course, does not bode well for the foundation of the law. And if the Supreme Court chooses to act, Abe's accomplished collective self-defense and all new agreements with the US based on it will be void. Because of this inherent constitutional instability, Shinzo Abe's fight was not yet over. Abe stated in an interview in 2013 early in his second term, quote, I think that our constitution should stipulate that our self-defense forces are military forces, unquote. 
In 2018, the LDP brought forward a proposal to amend Article 9. Instead of deleting passages they hoped to retain public sympathy by adding a passage, the new Article 9 passage would look like this, quote, The provisions of the preceding clause shall not preclude the implementation of necessary self-defense measures to defend our country's peace and independence and ensuring the safety of the country and the people. And for that purpose, the self-defense forces, with its supreme commander being the prime minister who is the head of the cabinet, shall be maintained as an armed organization as provided by law. The conduct of the self-defense forces shall follow diet approval and other control as provided by law." Unquote. The committee aimed to propose the amendment to the parliament in 2020. Of course, because of COVID, this idea was abandoned and Shinzo Abe had to resign due to low popularity in the wake of his mismanagement of the pandemic. With his unfortunate and violent death in 2022, his personal dream of changing the constitution has ended. However, there are others who will pick up Abe's dream and continue to push for a more capable self-defense force. Let's take a look at some of the arguments for and against a revision of Article 9 and collective self-defense. Shinzo Abe often stated that constitutional revision serves the purpose of clarifying the status of the SDF, the right to self-defense and the right to enter security treaties. Right now, the Japanese SDF and the US-Japan Security Treaty are potentially unconstitutional. Also, Abe argued that it is ridiculous that the Japanese SDF, which are the ninth largest armed forces by military spending in the world, cannot be called an army. This notion of adapting the constitution to the political decisions is criticized by opponents who argue that instead of the constitution adapting, the SDF should adapt to the constitution. Proponents also often argue with example scenarios for a revision and collective self-defense. For example, if collective self-defense were outlawed and a ballistic missile was fired towards the US west coast, Japanese Aegis destroyer could not legally intercept the missiles as it was not headed for Japan. If the Japanese Navy provides screen ships for a US aircraft carrier in international waters and the carriers would be attacked, the Japanese ships could not engage the enemy until they have been fired at themselves. In these scenarios it seems ridiculous that Japanese forces could not help their immediate allies. Collective self-defense seems like a common sense issue. Critics argue, however, that these scenarios present only one part of collective self-defense. In theory, Japanese forces could be deployed overseas if American forces were attacked. In fact, this fear of getting dragged into American conflicts persisted during the Cold War in Japan, when a majority of the population had absolutely no interest in participating in the Korean War or Vietnam War. Ironically today, the situation is somewhat reversed as a conflict in East Asia involving Japan is much more probable than one involving the US. The increasing military spending of China 30-fold in the last 30 years, and the increasingly tense situation regarding Taiwan, as well as the constant threat posed by North Korea and now also Russia, leads many politicians to support an increase in Japan's security capabilities. Japan has relied on the US for much of its post-war history, but with the election of Donald Trump in 2016 who repeatedly stated his desire for other countries to do their part and increase their own security capabilities, it has become clear that reliance on the US for national security is not always given, especially since Joe Biden has somewhat retained the policy of his predecessor, albeit less public. In order for Japan to honor the US-Japan Security Treaty without the looming threat of unconstitutionality, a revision of Article 9 is indispensable. Opponents instead want to improve relations with foreign countries or make Japan completely non-aligned to eliminate geopolitical threats. Article 9 above all has existed in its form since over 70 years and has by now entered the national conscience of the Japanese, who are generally opposed to the idea of the SDF joining foreign conflicts. It is going to be immeasurably difficult for anyone to change the constitution. Even though with the election for the House of Councillors on July 10th, 2022, a two-thirds majority in both houses now exists for constitutional revision, how exactly which articles should be revised is far from agreed upon by the parties. Fumio Kishida, the current Prime Minister, has pledged to revise the constitution by adding a paragraph legitimizing the self-defense forces. Kishida, even though being a moderate in the LDP, has warmed up to the idea of moderate constitutional revision 
Kishida actually has a relatively good chance, maybe even better than Abe's. Not only does he possess the needed majorities in both houses, at the time of this video at least, but as a moderate he can whip his faction into supporting the revision by reassuring them he will not go too far. A reassurance like this coming from Abe would not have been believed. Conservatives on the other hand are gonna support revision anyways. Achieving a two-thirds majority in both houses to vote on a specific revision proposal is still going to be a high hurdle, especially during Covid and a dwindling economy, a time when most Japanese people could care less about constitutional questions. The people of course will have the final say, as they decide ultimately in a referendum. A constitutional revision has never seriously been tried in Japan, so the first attempt will no doubt reveal how Japanese people really react to an amendment. Polls are currently all over the place and offer no basis for projection. Depending on which newspaper you consult, there are wide discrepancies in support or opposition for a revision. While many people support revision in general, a revision of Article 9, and especially what kind of revision, is another matter. Now that we have the history and arguments, we should ask ourselves, should Article 9 be changed? For me personally, it is an issue I thought about for almost 10 years now, having not gotten any closer to a definitive answer during all this time. There is a fundamental conflict of noble pacifist idealism versus realpolitik for the geopolitical realities in East Asia. Some people may criticize this idealism as naive. A major nation like Japan with historical and geopolitical rivals basically surrounding it cannot survive without at least some form of modern army. Others might argue that a demilitarization along with serious efforts to repair relationships with the rival nations, for example by acknowledging war crimes, could change the geopolitical situation and make Japan into a non-aligned or neutral country, thus abolishing the need for an army. Of course, when actually looking at historically neutral countries like Switzerland, for example, it comes to mind that neutrality does not equal demilitarization or vice versa. A strong military does not inherently suggest an aggressive foreign policy. In the end, changing Article 9 will remain to be the biggest political issue in Japan, as long as it exists in its current form. Unless a myriad of factors come together, revision will be extremely difficult. That being said, the current situation of constitutional limbo is not sustainable and eventually will be sorted out, one way or the other. Hey guys, thanks for watching as always, I really appreciate it. Thanks to you guys, this channel now has over 200 subs and I just want to say thank you to everyone. As always, if you have any suggestions for future videos, leave me a comment. Have a nice day!